Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good to be with you this morning. How many of you people have ever voted before? <laughs> oh, that's good to see you. I'm looking forward to some voters making sure that you get that done. Um, let's see. This is very different campaigning in Utah than running for president and campaigning in Iowa. You spend most of your time in Iowa. In Iowa, being a Mormon was very unusual. People didn't quite know what to make of me. Here, it's comp I, I think most people know what a Mormon is. Although there, I remember knocking on the first 100 doors I'd knocked on uh, and, and asking people to vote for me. About 15 agreed they'd vote for me. About 50 said they were voting for someone else. And eight agreed to be baptized. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was quite an experience. Uh, now this morning I'm told that I'm to speak about leadership and entrepreneurship. And, uh, and so I'm going to give you some thoughts about uh, experiences I've had with folks who are leaders and entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm going to choose people who've been extraordinarily successful in the world's eyes. But in my view, leadership does not require uh, and is maybe not highly correlated with success in the world's eyes. And I'll come back to explain that in a moment. Uh, and instead of listing qualities of leadership that uh, I might try and um, uh, convince you are important, I will instead talk about some people and how they uh, live their lives and what I saw in them. One was, uh, I was trying to take a company public. When you uh, are taking a company public, you hire an investment bank and uh, the New Yorkers come out with a private jet. Wow, there we go, with a private jet. And uh, they fly you from city to city where there are typically institutions that are hopefully gonna buy some stock in your company when it goes public. So you get all these people lined up and on the day that you you announce why all these people buy the stock and hopefully the price does just fine. That's the idea. So we had hired Goldman Sachs, a big uh, New York investment bank, uh, to take us around and help us sell our company. And uh, one of the guys was a junior person, an associate at Goldman, name was Alan Goldberg. And uh, you know he was obviously trying to impress us, but more importantly, try and impress the partner from Goldman that was in charge of this project. He obviously wanted to be promoted at Goldman. And uh, as we, got uh, on uh, Friday morning, we, I think we went to Chicago on Friday morning, we, we landed and we're about to go to our first event. And he said, I'm gonna have to leave you now uh, because I need to get home to New York City uh, to be with my wife because it's the Sabbath for me tomorrow morning and I have to be in my home by sundown on Friday night uh, to uh, abide by the principles of my faith. And, uh, and I thought, wow, that's, uh, that's quite a gutsy move when you're trying to impress people and your partner and so forth, and you have to leave in the middle of this big production we're putting on uh, and go home because of your faith. And I've followed Alan Goldberg ever since. He was quite successful at Goldman Sachs. He went on to uh, start his own company. He has a private equity company with about $15 billion that he manages. I interacted with him just a few days ago. He sent me a book that I found most interesting. What struck me is that in this person who is a remarkable leader in my view, he has lived a life consistent with his most fundamental principles and values. Now, let me describe another person that uh, I found and was impressed with, a guy named Tom Monahan. Tom uh, lost his parents at a very young age. He and his brother did. They were raised in a Catholic orphanage. And uh, he went to University of Michigan under scholarship, but the scholarship was not sufficient to, uh, to pay all of his expenses, and so he he and his brother put their money together. Uh, they sold their Volkswagen, got $200, and bought a, a pizza shop from someone and made some pizza. And uh, the brother decided this was going nowhere, so he asked uh, Tom to buy out his half. So Tom had to buy him out, and so now Tom owned 100% of this pizza shop. Tom did well at it, and he did well enough that he did not go back to college. He just kept on making pizza and then opening other pizza shops. Uh, at the time I met Tom, uh, his company, Domino's Pizza, had thousands of pizza shops around the world, uh, and, uh, and he had lived a pretty good life. He uh, had done so well that he bought the Detroit Tigers baseball team. The year he bought them, uh, they won the World Series. Uh, he also bought a collection of uh, antique cars, vintage cars. He had, I don't know, hundreds of these extraordinary automobiles. He built a corporate headquarters that was uh, as expensive impressive as I'd ever seen with a huge office for himself as the chief executive. And then one day he said, you know what? I'm not living by the values that um, formed my childhood and that form my most inner self. 
this is not how I was taught to live as a uh, person in the Catholic Church. And so he signed something called, I'd never heard of it, the Millionaire's Vow of Poverty. And it said, I will not fly first class or fly in a private plane. I won't buy a luxury car and so forth. He moved out of his office at the headquarters and moved into his secretary's office. And um, so when I met him, he was there in this little kind of cubicle area. And uh, I said, you know, whose office is that over there? He said, well, that's now just a conference room. And uh, he lived a more modest life. And when I ultimately was able to successfully acquire his company from him, I got the ch chance to do something I'd never done before. I got to write a check for over a billion dollars. And I, got, you know, I wrote it down. I didn't let the bank write it. I said, I want to write this check myself. <laughs> it wasn't on my account, of course, but I, I wrote over a billion dollars to Tom Monahan and handed him this check. And uh, he smiled and turned it over and directed it all to Catholic Charities. Remarkable guy who had uh, sort of strayed from his, his principles, not that he'd done something terribly wrong, but he wasn't living in a way that he, he felt comfortable with himself, and so he, he came back to his principles. Both of these men I've seen as extraordinary leaders by virtue of understanding what was most important to them and living by those things. And I, I'll just take a, an aside here to mention, how do you find out what your most core values are and your principles are? You may think you know. I, I, uh, uh, when I was a, uh, a young consultant in, in the uh, consulting firm that I worked in, Bain, my boss uh, sent us off to work with some psychologists so that we could work better as, as a group. And at one point he said, look, uh, if you live in a way that's consistent with your core values, you'll be more successful in life and you'll be happier. If you live in a way that's inconsistent with those values, you will experience stress. Your heart, your body, all those things will be in constant stress day and night. And, uh, and so health and happiness are associated with living with your core values. And he said, I'm gonna help you find out what they are. So he said, I'd like you to write down the names of five people who you respect most, five people who've ever lived, who you respect most. And I don't recall precisely, but I think I put Jesus Christ at the top and Abraham Lincoln and my dad and so forth. I wrote five names down. Then he said, next to those five people, right next to each one of them, the three things you most associate with that person. So next to each one, I wrote three things. Took a little while to do so. And then he said, now you've got, you know, five people times three different principles, so that's 15 different items there. Circle the, uh, the words that you've referenced the most frequently. And I circled two or three, and they were love and service. I can't remember the third, love and service. And he said, the things you circled are your core values. Those are the things that are most profoundly meaningful to you. And if you live in a way that's consistent with that, you'll have better health and you'll be more successful in your life. So, Alan Goldberg and Tom Monahan uh, lived in a way consistent with their core values and can continue to do so, even though now and then have taken a departure. Now, let me take a very different course uh, and talk about a different uh, leader. This is a guy named Jim Leotold. Uh Jim, uh, I met in, uh, in Illinois during my campaign in 2008 for president. Uh, Jim explained to me that he graduated second in his high school class, second from the bottom. And, uh, uh, and he figured that college was not part of his future. Uh, and his dad, who was a, a pretty wealthy guy, uh, uh, said, look, uh, Jim, I want you to, to uh, enlist in the military and get some discipline in your life. And, and Jim said, look, I, I, wanna, I wanna start a business instead. And, and he agreed, uh, or he said to his dad, would you loan me $10,000? Uh, Cause I have a business, I wanna start a restaurant loan me $10,000, and at the end of a year, if I can't pay it back with interest, why then I'll, I'll go off and enlist in the military and, and begin a career there. And his dad said fine, gave him the $10,000, and then Jim went out to get started in the restaurant business. He was gonna do hamburgers, hot dogs, and so forth, but found out quickly that $10,000 is not enough. Uh, you know, you have to have a kitchen that meets all sorts of uh, safety standards and stainless steel and so forth and those little rollers that roll the hot dogs. He couldn't have enough money. What he did have enough money for was to set up stainless steel tables and, and shelves and so forth in his garage, his father's garage, and make sandwiches. And so he made sandwiches and then he would drive the sandwiches to the places that people lived. Now you may know Jim Leotold better as Jimmy John. 
uh, and uh, he has about 1,500 restaurants around the world uh, and about 30,000 people who work uh, in, his, in his company. And uh, uh, what is remarkable about Jimmy John, uh, well, a number of things. One is he got in and did it himself in the beginning and worked very hard. But I'm convinced that the reason that he was so successful was that he has the most infectious laugh I think I've ever heard. He is always smiling. He's a great big guy. He's big and round and just laughing all the time. Uh, you know, I saw him, I actually was invited to go on someone else's yacht in the Caribbean. And, uh, and this yacht was going into a dock. Uh, this was a little vacation my wife and I were taking in this fellow's boat and, and we pulled in next to this great huge yacht. And I looked over there and there was Jimmy John in the front of the yacht. I said, Jimmy, it's Mitt. And we waved at each other. We're only, I don't know, 20 feet apart. And, uh, and I said, is that yours? He said, oh yeah. I said, did sandwiches buy that yacht? He said, oh no, no, no. Extra cheese bought this yacht. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so uh, Jimmy John, enthusiasm, a positive attitude. You know, you like being with people who are positive. It's funny, you, you don't like being with people who see the negative in everything. I mean, sometimes it's fun to talk about all the negative stuff, but people that you really enjoy spending time with are happy and, and smiling and, and telling jokes and, and uh, just bring brightness to you. And that's Jimmy John, and enthusiastic. Uh, so a quality of leadership that I've found, not everybody's this way, but a lot of the leaders I've found are positive and optimistic and enthusiastic. Okay, another one, Meg Whitman. Uh, Meg Whitman uh, and I worked as consultants together at Bain, and then uh, she left to go uh, run a company. She was given the opportunity to run a toy company. It didn't go terribly well. Uh, and then she went to FTD Florists to run the FTD, and, and that didn't go terribly well. Uh, not, not her fault, but uh, in business, by the way, there's a lot of serendipity. There's a lot that you can't control. Uh, whether you succeed or fail is not always a measure of just how well you're doing, but things out of your control. Changes in technology, competitors that step in that you couldn't have anticipated. And so these businesses and these opportunities didn't work out for her. But the next one worked out great uh, because she was asked by a guy to come in and, and run a new company that had maybe 25 employees uh, called eBay. And, uh, and he gave her a bunch of stock to get her to come uh, become the chief executive officer of eBay. And of course, you know the story of that company, extraordinarily successful. After her career there, uh, she ran for governor of California and got trounced. And, um, uh, and then she uh, was asked by Hewlett Packard, probably the largest technology company in California, maybe the largest uh, company of its kind in California, to become the chief executive officer there. And, uh, and she went to Hewlett Packard because it was in real trouble. And she wanted to help turn it around. And she had some principles for turning things around. I'll mention a couple. One was focus, focus, focus. Decide what's critical and focus precisely and exclusively on those important things. And the second was build a team of people who are able to deal with the challenges and the, and the strategy that you have by virtue of your, your focused approach. And, uh, and in this work that she did, in this turnaround, she had what I'll call a clear-eyed unbiased perspective. She did not expect anyone to come in and save the company or make things better magically. She recognized it was up to her and she worked like crazy in her focused effort. She reminded me of someone I'd met earlier named F. Enzio Busha. Anyone here who's, I see a couple of old folks who, <laughs> sorry, but you're my age, uh, <laughs> who remember he was a general authority in my church and uh, German of birth. He had a uh, a family business, a printing business in Germany. And, uh, and he said, I was giving a ride uh, to my home. To he was going to spend the night with us. And I was giving a ride and I asked him about his business life before becoming a general authority of my church. And he said, this, this printing company was not doing well. And it was doing more and more poorly. And he thought it was going to have to go under. And he said, going bankrupt in Germany is different than going bankrupt in America. He said, in America, people say, okay, you know, lost your money, you'll start again and whatever. But he said, in Germany, this is a huge, not just a loss of face, but a, a, a breach of trust that you have with your employees. And, uh, and you would devastate their lives and your own life would be devastated. 
and he said, I was in, in great pain and peril. And he said, so I, he, uh, on, on the way home one day, he pulled off, it was at night, he mentioned, he pulled off into, next to a soccer field and went out in the middle of the soccer field and began to pray. And he said he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for God to step in and save his company and, uh, and make things better. He was, after all, a very good person, living the principles of his faith, living by his values, and he expected God to step in and help and prayed and prayed and prayed. And finally, he said, I heard a voice. He said, it's as clear as anything that's happened in my life. And the voice said one word. I'll see if I can get it here in Germany. Arbeit, which translated in English is work. That was it, work. In other words, it's up to you. You wanna save this enterprise, you're gonna to have to do it. My experience is there are a lot of folks that somehow imagine that good luck or even God will step in because they're good people and they wanna do good things and everything will be made better because of God. But great leaders I've known Hope for God's help wherever they can find it. But recognize it's up to them. And so Meg Whitman, she worked. And F. Enzio Bush, he worked and was able to save his enterprise. A big part of leadership is recognizing there's nothing more important than putting yourself with full of energy and passion into the work that you've got to do. Uh, let me take another leader or two. Um, Tom Stenberg. Tom Stenberg graduated from Harvard Business School and decided that uh, he was going to go a direction no one else went. Everybody else wants to go into banking and, and uh, investment banking and consulting. When you come out of business school uh, at Harvard, that's where uh, the top of the class goes. He was at the top of the class, but he said, I want to go where there's no competition. I'm going to go into the grocery store business. And sure enough, very quickly, he got promoted. But, uh, but people find him found him kind of caustic and hard to deal with, and he got fired. And uh, he was having a hard time finding a new job. But you know, while he was at the grocery store company, finest food stores, he, uh, he kept his eyes open and, uh, and was always observant about what was going on around him and what things were being do done well by others and one things that weren't being done well. Who, which of his suppliers were good, which were poor. Um, and, and one of the things he noticed was, we pay a heck of a lot of money for office supplies. All right, way too much money. And, and he noted, that, you know, now in the grocery store usually has a, a place where you can buy paper and pencils and so forth. But he said the markup on this was incredible. He says the markup on lettuce is like 5%. The mark, markup on paper was over 50%. And he said, boy, this is just crazy. And he looked around at stationary stores and they were even, had even a bigger markup. And he said, this just doesn't make sense. And so he decided to open a store that sold office supplies, but to sell it at prices that were much, much, much lower, 50% lower than the prices being sold in grocery stores and Walmart and everywhere else. And he called his first store Staples and went on to open hundreds of stores, thousands of stores, Ultimately, he had over 100,000 employees working at Staples. And his quality of leadership, not that he was easy to get along with, um, but he had this, uh, this constant, uh, if you will, clear-eyed look around him, this observant nature to see where there was opportunity. And almost every entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur I've met, became a successful entrepreneur, not by sitting in their room trying to dream up a new business, but instead, being involved in something, having a job, and seeing something that's really not getting done properly. I was at, uh, at Weber State, not Weber State, at Dixie State University the other day at their Innovation Center. And, uh, and, and a young entrepreneur there has invented a product which, uh, uh, which flowed from his, uh, uh, his personal experience. He works on a ranch, family ranch. And he said, one of the problems is getting water to the cattle. You have these big, long hoses. You put water in the trough, and then there's still water in the hose. And if it freezes, it'll bust the hose. So he came up with a little idea to put right at the, at the place where you attach the hose to the house with a little solar battery and uh, puts a little thing there. And uh, when the temperature drops below 34 degrees, it turns on a little fan and blows the water out of the, uh, out of the hose so that there's no water left in the hose when it gets cold enough to freeze. And now uh, Black & Decker 
and Stanley Tools are making his product and selling his, uh, his little product to people who have ranches. So where, where you're working, the things you're doing is where you see opportunities to create a business. I'll mention another one. This is a truck driver named Harold Hamm, Oklahoma City. Harold Hamm uh, uh, drives for 10 years uh, a truck in part to get enough money to go to school. Always interested in geology. He uh, uh, gets a degree in geology and, uh, and spends his time looking at maps of the United States and concludes that uh, while everybody is focused on Texas and Oklahoma for oil, that there's an opportunity in, uh, in North Dakota for oil. And, uh, and he goes to North Dakota and tries to raise some money to drill an oil well. It cost about $2 million to drill an oil well. And uh, he drilled where he thought there'd be oil and there wasn't. And people thought he was ridiculous because there were no oil wells in North Dakota. And then he got enough money to do another one. He drilled 12 wells, one after the other, dry, every single one. How he raised the money, I do not know. His 13th hit oil. And now the Bakken Range in North Dakota is one of the largest oil reserves in the world. By the way, he's doing just fine. Uh, so I, I, would, I would note that, that this, uh, this observant nature constantly looking at the places that you're involved in saying, what, what's missing here? Where's there an opportunity? That's one of the real qualities of entrepreneurship and leadership that I've seen witnessed. Now I'm gonna mention one more, uh, and this is a name that may be familiar to you, um, Bill Marriott. Bill, uh, and you know his business, of course. Uh, Bill Sr., Bill Marriott Sr. and Allie, his, uh, his wife, were raised in Marriott, Utah, and uh, went to Washington, D.C. as a young married couple. Uh, decided that there was a market for a hot dog stand, so they opened something called Hot Shops and sold hot dogs. Hot dogs in the afternoon, uh, oatmeal in the morning. And, uh, and they did fine, they did that for a while, and they noticed a lot of people come to Washington, D.C., and that there weren't a lot of good options for, uh, for staying the night, so he opened his first hotel near the airport, and, uh, and then another, and then another, and then his son took over. When there were about five hotels, his son took over. Now Bill Marriott Jr., who by the way is about 84, Bill Marriott Jr. Uh, expanded the company. It has what's well, the largest hotel company in the world now with about 5,000 hotels. There are 700,000 people in the world that wear a Marriott badge or one of their brand's badges to work every day. 700,000 people. Now I tell you this story because Bill Marriott Sr. and his son Bill Marriott Jr. have an unusual personal quality. They really care about other people. I don't just mean that in a superficial way. I mean fundamentally, they really care about others, particularly those who work with them, their associates. If you go w with them into the hotel, and I've been with Bill Marriott Jr. many times and with his dad. Uh, I was named after his dad. Uh, J. Willard Marriott Sr. is his name, and I'm Willard. My first name is Willard after Bill. But anyway, I've gone with him into a hotel they don't just go by the doorman. They stop and shake hands with the doorman and ask him or her about uh, their family and how long they've been with the company. They go inside, they meet all the people. They go behind the front desk, of course they can. They go behind the front desk and they don't just say hello to the general manager and have him or her take them around the, the hotel. No, they, they say hello to each person. And if they come back to that hotel, they typically remember the name of one or two at least of those people. And this extraordinary concern for others is something which has affected the entire company. Over the years, people have, in some respects, adopted the kind of personal concern they have. And people remark, when we do consumer surveys, I say we, I'm on the board of Marriott now, when, when we do uh, surveys, customer surveys, about how people think about the hotel chain, one of the things they often mention is that the employees are more uh, thoughtful and observant and caring than in other hotel brands. And I'm convinced that goes all the way back to J. Willard Marriott Sr., Bill Marriott, that his character has affected all these people. And that's the quality of leadership. My experience in life is that one person at the top of any enterprise, a church, a family, uh, a school, university, a business, a government, has an enormous impact on the culture and quality of the entire organization. And so I tell you this because um, 
I've told you a number of folks who are at the top of some great enterprise. But to become a leader and have an influence in others does not require you being at the top. You won't start at the top. You'll start at the very bottom. But you can be a leader whether you're there or there in an organization. Because you can have the same qualities that I've just mentioned of these people who are relatively famous. You can live by your principles. You can be optimistic and, and enthusiastic like, uh, like Jimmy John. Like F. Enzio Busha and Meg, Meg Whitman, you can recognize the importance of, uh, of hard work and taking responsibility for the enterprise that, or the work that you, the job that you have. Uh, like Bill Marriott and Allie Marriott, you can, uh, you can show your principles in such a way that others want to be more like you and, and adopt those principles. So, so leadership and entrepreneurship happens whether you're at the top or at the bottom. Well, I've gone on longer than you wanted. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and take some questions from you, but I, uh, I, I salute you in your, your effort to become leaders and entrepreneurs and recognize that as you measure yourself in your life, that what counts most is not how high you get on some rung or how much money you make, because that is out of your control to a greater degree than you can imagine. But your success in life will be measured by the things that you care about most deeply. Very best of luck in your work ahead. Thank you so much. Now, you get to ask some questions. I don't think we need a microphone here uh, for, for you. You just shout it out, and if you can't hear, I'll repeat it for you. I will note that personal, awkward questions are always the most interesting. So please, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Mr. Romney, we are delighted and honored that you are here in Cedar, and your remarks uh, are greatly appreciated. Uh, my name is Bruce Hughes, and I've been in the business world about almost 50 years. Not as many as you, right? <laughs> I got out of the business world in 1999, so, you know. <laughs> but uh, in that period of time, most of it has been as an entrepreneur. And we know that America is one of the hotbeds of entrepreneurship. And one thing I've observed that perhaps the biggest obstacle in this country now to entrepreneurship is government on a, a, a local level as well as on a a national level, we, we deal with it and fight with it right here in Cedar City. Would you care to comment about that? Yeah, sure, and let me, uh, yeah. And by the way, tell uh, Matt Walter a hello for me. I helped raise that kid. Oh, wow, <laughs> he's my campaign manager. Um, <laughs> Uh, so uh, uh, government, and, and, and obviously government and regulation are essential for the working of a, uh, of a capitalist um, a free enterprise system. Uh, you can't have people uh, stealing technology and stealing property and doing things that would cause people pain and poisoning people. I mean, you have to have regulation to make an economy work. And, and I sort of pile uh, regulations in two buckets. Um, one is, is those things that are done to try and make the market work more efficiently and protect citizens. Those are good regulations. Then there are regulations where an existing business wants to prevent a competitor from affecting their, uh, their livelihood. So they come up with some regulations and they go, you know, they lobby some people in the legislature to put in a regulation, for instance, to say, uh, um, I don't want to get in too much trouble here, but let's say, so you can't buy a Tesla in Utah the same way you buy them in California because the Dealers Association has come together and gotten legislation that says Teslas can't be sold in the way they're sold in California. And, uh, and that's a regulation which is designed to keep people out and, uh, and make sure the people that are already in are protected in their investment. And I understand the, the sentiment. Uh, that's sometimes uh, you'll find that if you want to be a, uh, uh, let's say a, a, a massage therapist, why you've got to get a, a, a permit to be able to do so. Part of that is I'm sure to protect you from people who are uh, not very good at it or might hurt you, but the other is just to make sure that you can limit the number of people who are massage therapists. So one of the jobs that I think you have in government is to try and sort between those things that are designed to make the market work better and those things that are instead designed to make, make the market work less well and make it harder for people to uh, begin a business. Um, and where you draw that line depends upon, in some respects, your point of view. One of the challenges with bureaucracy is that if you have a job as a bureaucrat, unless you're doing something, you're afraid you're going to lose your job. And being a bureaucrat 
bureaucrat is a good job. You don't have to do much work, and you know, you don't, you're never going to get fired. Uh, so you want you uh, uh, you've got to do something every day. So you come up with regulations. And, and my own view is that every now and then you've got to just go back and just cut them all out like a weed whacker. And, uh, and I, I, I wish at the federal level, for instance, that we had a provision that said, and I'd like to vote for this if I get there, we have a provision that says regulations that are put in place by government agencies have to regularly be approved or rejected by the elected officials. Congress has to vote them up or down as opposed to just keeping them in year after year because these regulators will just build massive regulation. That's something which I think people of my conservative ilk um, find very important. Because, by the way, um, the reason I'm conservative and a Republican is I believe conservative principles are best at improving the lives of average American citizens. And you th people say, oh, but you guys are for business. You Republicans are for business. It's like, well, the only way I know how to raise wages and salaries in America is if businesses are doing better and better, and new businesses are starting and existing businesses are growing, and so they have to compete with each other to hire people. And in competing with each other to hire people, they, they have to raise, you know, raise the offer, raise wages. That's the only way I know how to get real wages to go up. So, I, yeah, I want small businesses and big businesses to grow. Not because I'm worried about the guy that owns the business, because he or she, they do fine under Republicans or Democrats. But the average worker, they do better under Republican principles. That's my own view. And one of those principles is keep regulations as low as you can. Make sure they're there to make the, the market work effectively. But don't have them become so burdensome that businesses find it very hard to get underway or to grow. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yes, sir. So uh, I grew up listening to talk radio. Uh-oh, uh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> He coins many axioms, a lot of sayings, and he says courage is one of the most important virtues. Uh, when you're in the private sector and other people's jobs and com you know, the company you've worked so hard to create, when that's all on the line, especially in a recession, how do you summon that kind of courage to make the best kind of decisions? Uh, you know, um, I, I don't think it's as hard as you might imagine uh, when you recognize that the decisions you're making are affecting the lives of a lot of people. It's not as hard as you might imagine to do what you think is right. Um, the, uh, the, the stress is extraordinary. I have to tell you, if you find yourself in a position where you're responsible for decisions that will affect the lives of others, as well as your own life, your own family and so forth, why well, you're under a lot of stress. And uh, in a circumstance like that, taking action which is consistent with your own principles and your values requires courage, as Alan Goldberg demonstrated by getting off that plane and flying home to observe the Sabbath. Um, uh, but you know, going to work and putting all your energy behind it, as Meg Whitman and FNCO Busha did, that's also part of the, of the process. I, you know, how you make decisions is, um, I didn't get into this, but um, people have a different approach to making decisions. Some people sort of say, you know, I, I have this gut feel that th there's an opportunity here, or I should do that. Uh, that's not how I've approached decision making. Um, I'm analytical by nature. Uh, I like a lot of data. I used to, when I'd go consulting into a company, I would get all sorts of reports and data and analysis. Well, I used to call it bathing myself in the data. I like looking at data. I mean, for instance, in education, uh, I, I became governor of Massachusetts, and um, uh, it was important for us to get our, our kids more competitive, to make sure they're doing better in school. And so I asked folks, what do you have to do to to make our schools better. And they said, well, you need to have smaller classroom size. And by the way, my gut said, that's right. Yeah, smaller classroom size ought to be the best way to improve our schools. And I said, but what does the data show? And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, we're government. We have all this data. I mean, government gets all sorts of reports, but people who are decision makers rather rarely look at it because they think they already know the answers. It's like, well, let's look at the data. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, we have 351 school districts in Massachusetts. 351. We test our kids every year in English and math and now science. And so we have an average score for each school district for how their kids are doing. We also know the average classroom size in every school district. So let's plot average classroom size 
and the school and student performance and see if there's a relationship. So we plotted it, 351 points, and there was no relationship at all. As a matter of fact, the school district with the smallest classroom size scored in the bottom 10% of student performance, Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's like, how, how can that be? And some of the school districts that were at the very top had very, very large classrooms, even though the students were doing extraordinarily well. It's like, well, what's going on here? And so we began gathering data from uh, analysis done by another consulting firm called McKinsey. McKinsey Institute is a, is a charity that's a spinoff of the consulting firm McKinsey and Company. And they went around the world looking at schools in Finland, South Korea, Singapore that are among the best in the world and said, why are they so good? And uh, they found something unusual. Teachers drawn in those countries from college are drawn from the top five or 10% of college graduates. Whereas in America and in our state, oftentimes, at that time when I was serving, when I say our, I was talking about Massachusetts, we were sometimes drawing not from the top. We were drawing people who were not performing at the very top. And that turned out to be the most critical determinant of how good a school was. How good are the teachers? Kind of, that does make sense, doesn't it? And, uh, and so everybody began to focus on, we need to hire better teachers into this system. And instead of promoting teachers when they got really, really proficient to become administrators and running the school, no, no, let's have them stay in teaching. Uh, th those people who maybe are not as great at teachers, let them be the administrators, all right? And, uh, and, and so the whole focus began, was, was on higher starting salaries for teachers so we could attract the best and brightest into teaching a career track in teaching with better pay as a teacher, and, uh, and that's what made better schools. Now, by the way, uh, the state of Massachusetts ranked no ranks number one consistently in all four measures that the federal government tests uh, students around the country. And it's not because of me, but there were governors before me that figured this out. Um, so data in, my, in making decisions have the courage not just to go with your gut, and what you feel is right, but to get data and analyze it and look at it, look for trends and make decisions on that basis. Yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Hi. I'm in the arts administration program here. Um, and we focus, our program focuses heavily on nonprofit, which for the most part means we're not in it for the money. Um, and I'll reference Tom Monahan because as far as your stories go, he's the one I know most about being an alumna of the university he founded. Oh, of uh, Ave Maria University? Oh, um, wonderful. But he actually, it seems that his motivations were more money-based than altruism. It wasn't until he sold Domino's that he founded a university and a town built around that. Um, so my question to you, going into business, uh, business leadership, not in it for the money, how do you balance motivations with practices? Um, and uh, I guess, other than work ethic, what advice do you have? Yeah, um, I'll note this. If you, if you measure yourself, if you measure your own success and whether you've had a successful life, and by the way, if you feel that you're successful, you'll be, you're happier. If you feel you're not successful, why, you feel a little disappointed. And so how do you measure success? If, if you measure success by uh, how much money you make or how many promotions you get, you're bound to be not real happy because there's way too much serendipity or luck or bounce of the ball or whatever you want to call it in life. That's just the way it is. I mean, it's fun to be in the game of life and, and to, to, to do as well as you possibly can, but recognize it's not entirely up to you. And uh, in my view, the real currency in life is not money or promotion. The real currency in life is the friends you have and the people you love and, uh, and your relationship with your God. And those are the things that, uh, that measure your life. And so if, if you're doing something like Tom Monahan is having, I didn't tell the rest of the story, I'm glad you did, which is founding a university, Ave Maria University, Catholic-oriented university in Florida, building a town around it. If, if, you're, if your motivation is to do things that are consistent with your values, you're a, high, a successful, happy person. And those things are in your control. By the way, your relationship with God is not subject to serendipity. Your friendships, not subject to serendipity. I mean, one of, the, one of the greatest things I got out of school, from K through 12 all the way through graduate school, 
was not the things that I learned necessarily, but the relationships I had and the friendships I had. I, we're, I'm still friendly and in contact with friends from high school. And, uh, and that's a source of great satisfaction to me. So find things that you enjoy, but, but recognize that uh, in this experience of life, your, uh, your sense of accomplishment and success is not measured uh, by things out of your control. But if you're wise, you can focus your life on things you do control, your God, your family, your friends. And with that, I want to say, I see your time is up. You got to go to a class, another class. This isn't a class, I hope. Uh, and so I, 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 I wish you the very best. My life did not proceed in any, in any way like I thought it would. Um, I never expected to get involved in politics. Matter of fact, when I stepped into the uh, Republican convention, when I was first running for governor, I turned to my, my wife, Ann, and I said, sweetheart, in your wildest dreams, did you ever see me getting involved in politics? And she said, Mitt, you weren't in my wildest dreams. <laughs> with that, thank you so much. Good to be with you this morning. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thunderbird. <laughs> if, I, if I could, just for a second. Um, the, first time, the first time I heard the name uh, Mitt Romney was in 1993. That's 25 years ago. It was before uh, he had become a, a public figure. I was serving a, an LDS mission in Paris, France, uh, and my companion wouldn't stop talking about how great this guy was who had such an impact on his life personally. Um, and I say that because I've heard versions of that story many, many, many times since about Mitt Romney. He's an outstanding business leader, but um, he's also an outstanding, uh, an outstanding human being. And with that in mind, I'd like to present him with uh, SUU's Thunderbird Award, uh, in recognition of his visit here to SUU. Thank you. Thank you. Merci, mon frère. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.